Hello, I'm Ellen Horseman, and I welcome you to Camden, Arkansas, First United Methodist Church Sunday School class, where we continue to look at the Apostles' Creed. Uh, before we do that, let me get started uh, by reading you just a short little excerpt from 1 Peter chapter 3. Make that chapter 2. Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Who's Peter talking to? He's talking to the church or the members of the church. So hear what Peter says to you, church. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so we turn to that part of the Apostles' Creed where we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. So that's what we're looking at, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. So let's start first with this idea, the Holy Church. Can you imagine what people might say looking at your church if you're calling it the Holy Church? What do we mean by that? I like the way that uh, United Methodist Pastor Reverend, what's his name, James A. Harnish spoke about this. He said, now sometimes it's hard to believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Oh, it's easy enough when you spiritualize the church as the mystical union of all those who believe in Christ. But when you bring it down to earth and you look at it in real places, when you get to know the history of its failures and compromises with evil, when you get involved in this huge hulking institution with all its denominational differences, its budgets and committees, its confusion and debate, when you look around and you see it filled with folks like us, doesn't it stretch your imagination to say that this is the Holy Catholic Church? This is the communion of saints. Aren't there times when it seems that the church is a lot like Noah's Ark? The only way to stand the stench on the inside is to remember the storm on the outside. So, yes, it's kind of cute how he says that, but Reverend Harnish definitely has a point. The church doesn't always seem so holy or so Catholic. Uh, well, we'll get to Catholic in a minute, but it doesn't always seem so holy. Not when we look at it like that. Uh, but what does holy mean anyway? When we think of it, I guess we always have the picture of the halos and people being all saintly and everything. But holy doesn't really have that meaning. Holy actually means set apart or set apart for God. And so the word holy was applied to many things. Uh, the, the, the tabernacle was holy because it was set apart for God. The temple was holy because it was something special, something set apart for God. And God called the Israelites holy, set apart for God. Now, that doesn't mean the Israelites were better than other people. Read their history in the Old Testament, and you'll see that they were not. But they were people who were set apart, God says, from the very beginning when he calls Abraham, and then he continues to say this to Abraham's descendants, that they are going to be a blessing to all nations. So they are set apart, they are called out, so that they can be a special blessing to all nations, connecting other people with God. Uh, Reverend Harnish, to go back to him again, says, to say that a church is holy is to say that ordinary people like us have been called out by God for God's purposes. We are chosen, not for privilege, but for service, to be a living model of the kingdom of God which is being fulfilled on earth, even as it already is fulfilled in heaven. So that's what it means to be holy. We're called out, we're set apart to be God's own people. So if the church actually belongs to God and is set apart for God's own purposes, then we members should not be asking ourselves, what can my church do for me? Or, or saying things like, well, I'm not getting that much out of my church. 
Instead, well, the real thing we should be asking is, what can I do for God's church? What can I do through and with the church for my God instead of what can it do for me? Okay, so we've taken care of holy. What about Catholic? Of course, a lot of times when people hear that word, they narrow it down to one denomination. But the word Catholic, if you if you ever do the Apostles' Creed in a hymn book, you'll always see the little asterisk. And you look down and it says universal. And that's a good translation. Catholic means universal, worldwide. Um, I think Hamilton said that it comes from a compound of two words that together mean everywhere. So it's the church everywhere. The Catholic church then is every Christian church, every Christian congregation, every denomination, every church in every land in the entire world. That's the Catholic church, the universal church. It is what we sometimes refer to as the church of Christ. And just like the word Catholic, you know, there is a particular denomination that has taken that name unto themselves. But in, in a larger sense, when we talk about the Church of Christ, we're talking about Christians everywhere. So that's what we mean by the Catholic Church. Uh, the Catholic Church, the Church, the Church of Christ, was actually intended to be united, to be one. That's what Jesus longed for. Look at his uh, prayer in the, I'll get it out here in a minute, the 17th chapter of John. You have this beautiful long prayer of Jesus. And in that prayer, Jesus prays for his disciples that they may be one, he says, Heavenly Father, as you and I are one. That's what Jesus desired, that we would be one church, one people, united together. Uh, he, Jesus tried to teach his disciples and through them to teach us from the very beginning that we were to love one another, that we are to forgive one another, that we are not to judge one another. We are meant to be one. Uh, William Barclay says that, that the term Catholic and that the Catholic Church, when it came along, the universal church, removed all barriers. He said at that point in the ancient world, it's like every nation and sometimes every city had its own God. So we have our God and you have your God. And, and, and they're, they didn't, uh, I'm, I'm losing my words here, but they were separated from each other. Uh, he said that uh, religion was a nationalistic thing and the line was rigidly drawn between, say, like Greek and Jew or Greek and bar barbarian, between slave and free, between man and woman. These they didn't merge with each other. They didn't worship together. They had these very strict lines. And so he says, when we begin to see in the New Testament, the idea of a Catholic church that reaches out, this is a way of bringing people together. That's why Paul says, uh, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, enslaved and free. But Christ is all and in all. That's from Colossians, and he says something very similar in Galatians. So Barclay, uh, William Barclay adds that the great condemnation of sex, and I'm saying S-E-C-T-S, the great com uh, con condemnation of anything that would be a sect is not that they may have bad theology, although that's not a good thing to have bad th theology, but more importantly, a, a, a sect, a breakaway, it, fra it splits into fragments that very thing which should be united into one. He says a church which is less than universal is a contradiction in church. I mean, not a church. Let me say that again. A church which is less than universal is a contradiction in terms. So we've not done so well in that Jesus intended for us to be one. And we kept splitting, you know, we split into the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church, and then we split into uh, different Protestant denominations, and then they've split, and they keep splitting, splitting, splitting. And every time we do that, we're moving away from what God intended for, for us to be. We're moving away from what Jesus desired for his church. Nevertheless, we believe in spite of the way that we've messed things up, we humans, by splitting into all these denominations, that Jesus still holds together his church, this one Catholic universal church of Christ.
So we believe in the Holy Church and we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. But what do we mean by the word church anyway? Well, of course, by now we know, I mean, sometimes we use the word church to talk about a building, but we know that it's not the building. I couldn't help but think when we, when I was thinking, yeah, the church is people, uh, but of this hymn that you all are familiar with, we are the church. I had to look it up to see who wrote this, and it was written in 1972, both the words and the music, by Richard K. Avery and Donald S. Marsh. Marsh. I bet he'd like me to get his name right. Now, just looking at the first verse, it actually starts with the chorus, but the church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Now, you may be wondering why I didn't sing that to you, but if you heard me sing very often, you wouldn't wonder for very long. You'd be like, oh, thank you that you didn't sing that. Okay, so the church isn't a building. The church is the people. Uh, the Greek word for church say, uh, that is used at least, I think, over 80 times in the, in the New Testament, this is according to Adam Hamilton, this one word is uh, ecclesia, which translates out as called out. And it was used for any kind of an assembly of people. I think it was William Barclay I read that said, like in the, in the ancient Greek towns, when they would have meetings, uh, their little democracies like they had in Athens, well, everybody wasn't just sitting up there on the uh, hill at all times for this meeting. So the leader would send out a runner to call out the people and they would assemble together. Ecclesia, ecclesia well, ecclesia, if I can get that out right. So it's called out. It, it was it referred to as an assembly, uh, which might be uh, a, an assembly of people for a worship service, like in a synagogue or an assembly of people for a civic purpose. But that's what it meant. But in the New Testament, the word came to mean more than just the actual assembly, but just like we said about church, it applied to the people, the people called Christians. That's why Jesus says to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about making a building on a rock or for a foundation. But when Peter had made that declaration, you are the Messiah, the Christ. Then Jesus said, on this rock, Peter, I'm going to build my church. Uh, a second, there's another word for church that's used in, in the New Testament. And I'm not sure how to pronounce this like I knew pronounce the other one. But it's uh, Karagon. Uh, and that Greek, that Greek word made its way into German, and from German it made its way into English. And so our word church is actually derived from that same word uh, in the New Testament, karakon, church, and it literally translates out as belonging to the Lord, belonging to the Lord. So that means that our word church literally trans out meaning belonging to the Lord. Wow. What would it be like if we human beings could remember, if we church members could remember that the church is not ours, it belongs to God? Boy, churches have a hard time with that concept sometimes. They think the church is theirs. And as uh, Hamilton pointed out, you have these issues or problems as people struggle for control within a, within a church and then within a denomination. Uh, you know, he said, sometimes you might have a pastor that acts like the church belongs to me, the pastor. Or you may have uh, leaders in the church that act like it belongs to me or Sunday school classes that act like it belongs to them or uh, what I call the old timers that don't like these new folks. And the church is not ours. It belongs to God. And sometimes we act as if it, you know, you know, just think of examples of people messing up. If it's somebody other than me, I don't want to tell on myself. But I'm thinking about one time that I was in a in a pastor parish relations committee with two other churches. We all shared the same pastor, and one of the churches they did not like the pastor, the pastor that we currently had. And I remember listening to them telling the district superintendent. This is our church. 
we built this church up. We took this church from small and we grew this church. And of course, since it wasn't, since I wasn't the one speaking, I remember thinking to myself then, you built the church? You grew the church? Of course not. The church grew because of the Holy Spirit. The church was built on the foundation of Jesus Christ our Lord. The church does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And so, as Hamilton says, that means that the driving mission of every local church should be to discern the will of Christ above all else and then to do Christ's will. It's not about us. It's about what Jesus Christ desires from us. But, you know, speaking of church, do we really need a church as individuals? I think there's a lot of people that believe in God. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the Holy Spirit. But they're not so sure that they believe in the Holy Catholic Church in the sense that they believe that they need to be involved in a church or or more than just involved or more than just being a member. Sometimes they don't think they need to be a member. Sometimes they think they can be a member, but they don't need to come to church. Uh, not, not everybody comes to that decision the same way. I mean, sometimes you have people who have been deeply wounded by a church, and that's a difficult thing. And I think if they've been hurt too badly by one church, it may be that they, in order to feel comfortable and to get back worshiping, they might need to go to another church at least for a while, if not permanently. But I think maybe more often than that, people drift away. Now, we, of course, we had some big time drifting because of COVID. It got easy to get in the habit of not physically showing up in church. But people drift away for a lot of reasons. They don't mean to miss, and then they miss this time and that time, and then it becomes a habit. But we are missing something when we miss church. Now, I have to tell you, as a person who has really missed some of our some of our families that used to come to church with us every week, you are being missed, but you're missing out on something first. Well, why do we need a church? If I believe in Jesus Christ, isn't that enough? Do I really need to be a part of a church? Do I really need to go to church and, and to go on a regular basis? Well, I want you to ask you this question. Who created the church? Whose idea was it that there would be a church? Who created the church? Well, it was Jesus who created the church. You hear him saying to Peter on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Jesus intended for there to be a church. Jesus intended for us to be part of that church. And you might say, well, wait a minute now, he didn't have church. Yes, Jesus was a regular synagogue attender, but he also called out disciples and he prepared them. And he told them he was going to build the church upon their faith. He started that church. And look how deliberate he was about it. He called out disciples. He, he gave them a mission. He, uh, he, he, he basically told them that they were going to have to be set apart, that they were going to have to be different. He said, you are going, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. He charged them to take that obligation seriously to be a light of the world, that they would live in a way that was so loving and so lovely that they would draw other people to Jesus Christ. And then he charged them to expand that group. They were to teach what they had learned from Jesus Christ to other people, and they were to draw other people to Jesus, and they were to have an impact on the world. They weren't just supposed to teach in their local town. They were supposed to go into all the world. That church is established by Jesus Christ and at the will of Jesus Christ. So all of us who follow, follow those early disciples, you know, we are called out not just to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, we need one. And yes, by all means, I encourage you to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But we are also called out to love. We are called out to bring other people to Jesus Christ. We are members of his holy church. And when we stop going to church or when we frequently miss, we're letting ourselves down and we're letting down Jesus Christ. We're humans. We need to be together in community. We were built to be in community. But the church 
of Christ is a unique community. It's not like any other human commun- community. Church is not a, a club or a, it, it's not a social organization. It is a special called out group of people meant to love Jesus and to show other people the, the love of Jesus. We are called out to be the body of Christ. And Hamilton says that we all need community, but that uh, when we don't become a part of a church or when we quit going to church, he said many essential things to the Christian spiritual life are lost when we don't have a community of others who are holding us accountable, helping us to grow, people who who need us to serve, who are challenging us to care for others, to pray with others, and just messing up this quotation. I'm going to start over again because I'm getting my pronouns wrong. Ding. Erase what you just heard and listen to this. Here's Hamilton. Many essential things to the Christian spiritual life are lost when you don't have a community of others who are holding you accountable, helping you grow, needing you to serve, challenging you to care for others, praying with and for you, and giving structure to you, your Christian life. So it's better if I get it right, and I'm sorry, my cat was trying to bite my hand, so I got a little distracted. You know, the church is a family. You've heard people say that, and it should be a family. But families come with blessings. Families also come with responsibilities. You don't just quit on your family. Families care for one another, and they work for the good of one another, and they support one another. And as members of a church, we need to take our family responsibility seriously. That means we need to look around and see if there are people that look like they're uncomfortable, they look like they need someone to, to uh, what's the word, to, to encourage them, to make them feel welcome. Uh, we need to see if there's someone who needs checking on. We need to see if there's someone who needs visiting. We need to provide loving support, non-judgmental support uh, for the members of our family. So, uh, and Hampton says, if you have trouble seeing your church as a caring family or a community that follows Jesus, that cares for one another, that takes care of each other, then what Hamilton says that he'll ask of people when they say that to him, he says, what are you doing to help it be this kind of community? He goes on to say that caring communities are made up of people who go the extra mile, uh, who give up their time to serve others, who go out of their way to bless others. And it only takes a handful of people like that to inspire other people to do the same. So what do we say to those who say they don't need a church? Now, I marked page 116 and 17 in Hamilton's book because I guess I thought he says this better than I do. And I better get with it. I'm taking too long. Don't leave me because this is a long lesson. Now, Hamilton says, occasionally I hear people say they don't need the church. I don't want to ask them, really, you don't need encouragement from others. You don't need the blessings of worship and Eucharist, a message drawn from the scriptures or a congregation that like a family stands together and has a greater impact on the world as a group than they could alone. But even if you found some way to gain all these benefits without the church, I would still say to a person, if you are a follower of Jesus, it's not just that you need the church, but that the church needs you. There are people at the church who need you to show up, to offer a word of encouragement, to teach a class, to lead a support group, or to just stand at the door and welcome people. The church was not a human invention. It was founded by God. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is a community that belongs to God. We were meant to be the church. We are the body of Christ in the world. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. And we do this best ministering to a hurting world, helping those in need when we do it together as a church. And finally, and I've taken a lot of time, so let me see if I can very quickly talk about the communion of saints. Of course, when we hear the word saints, we always have to laugh because we we think of the people with the halos. The word for saint was from the same root as the word for holy. So it means set out or called out, belonging to God or set apart for God. So when we say the communion of saints, we're not talking about people with halos. 
we're talking about ordinary, everyday Christians. If you're a member of a church, you are the saints of the church. And, and as uh, Hamilton points out, it has kind of a, more than one level of meaning. You're a saint once you become a member of the body of Christ, once you accept Jesus, because you have been called out, you belong to God, but you're also continuing to grow in the Holy Spirit. You are praying, you are uh, doing works of mercy, you are reading the scriptures, and you're asking the Holy Spirit to help you to grow so that you are becoming sanctified, growing more and more like the person that God created you to be. So in that way, you're sanctifying, and I guess you could say instead of sanctifying. And then Hamilton said that finally, when we pass from this life into the next, the Holy Spirit finally completes that work in us. He finally and completely sanctifies us so that uh, in heaven, we are finally and fully the saints that God intended us to be. But the communion of saints, which deals with us church members, also means the, the great body of people who have gone on before us. And, and we are in communion with them. And I just love the way that Hamilton talked about this. I'm going to flip around here. On page 124, I'm just going to read parts of what he says here. He says, the last thing to note about the phrase communion of saints involves the word communion in one of the most beautiful ideas in Christian theology. The idea is that those who are becoming saints here on earth and those who have become entirely sanctified in heaven still commune together. Now he goes on to say, no, I don't think that the people in heaven necessarily are watching us every minute of the day. And yet he said, I still believe uh, that our loved ones who have died continue to love and care for us and await the day when we will be reunited with them. I think they do pray for us. And he has this beautiful thought. He said, I believe the communion of saints means that there are moments in our lives here on earth when God says to those who are dear to us in heaven, we want you to see something. And then he allows them to join us from above. He says, Hamilton does, that when Christians gather for worship, we enter into one of those thin spaces where heaven and earth meet. And I believe that we are never closer to our loved ones who have died and are with God in heaven than when we worship. Well, friends, that's another reason to come to church, so that at worship we can be closer to those whom we love who have gone on before. Uh, we are set apart to be members of the church, and we are part of that communion of saints. And I think that uh, there's no better way that that's ever been put than it was in, in Hebrews. You remember in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the writer talked about all these people of faith that had gone before. And as he moves into what we call the 12th chapter, the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame. We are part of this great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, who have worked to help build up the body of Christ. We are part of and that cloud of witnesses is with us as we struggle today. Yes, we believe in the Holy Catholic Church and in the communion of saints. May God bless you all this week, my dear friends and communion of saints. Bye-bye.